and then um, relevant to that you may have your cameras on or off whatever you're comfortable with but I do ask that you uh, mute mics uh, this is going to be a fairly big class if everybody who signed up uh, actually tunes in um, I will do my best to take questions from the chat bar, but it is a big class, so I'll bear with me if I get a little behind. And similarly, if you have to leave and log back in, bear with me. I will be keeping an eye on the, on the waiting room, but um, there, there's a fairly sizable class here. Um, asking questions in chat is great. I'll try to deal with them as I can as they fit into the flow of the topic. Um, I will also offer open mic questions uh, at the end of the session. So if that's more, more convenient for you, feel free to write down and save up your questions and, and hit me with them there. So native plants uh, in, in our region, native plants of the Pacific Northwest, and specifically Western Oregon, um, they have a really wonderful uh, diversity of native plants here. And they offer some really good aesthetic, practical, and also environmental benefits to your landscape. Uh, so we're trying to encourage more use of native plants. And to, to that end, I want to talk a little bit about what is native um, and what, what that really means. Go through a list of natives that are suitable for general landscaping, not just for the native plant restoration jobs. And, uh, and so go through a fair good listing of those and then talk a little bit about how to integrate those native plants uh, into a landscape. So that's kind of our agenda on the day and we'll move on into it. So native seems like it would be an obvious term, but there's actually more complex than you might think. Um, native generally would mean plants that occurred here originally that are, were not introduced by man. Bro broadly speaking, we like to say um, plants that existed in our area prior to European settlement, as even the indigenous peoples moved some plants around from place to place a bit. Um, so that's one level of the definition. Um, you can get increasingly specific past that as to how narrow you want to make your classification of, uh, of native. So we can talk about U.S. native plants, and those are natives, but natives from the East Coast or natives from the, from the Plains states are not really native to our area. Um, natives to Oregon certainly defines it a bit better, but conditions uh, in the, in the uh, alkali uh, high desert or in the high mountain areas are significantly different from natives on the coast or in the valley. So we do have to kind of narrow down native to a local region uh, and talk about the plants that are specifically endemic to that area when we're, when we're talking native. Um, it would seem obvious that natives are a diverse group um, and that they would encourage, we would encourage the natural diversity of the genetics. Um, obviously, hybrids, crosses between a native species and a non-native species, should not be categorized properly as native. It gets more iffy sometimes, though, when you're talking about two different native species. So if you're talking about two different native species and they occur naturally in, uh, in, a, in a region together, overlapping regions, and they can interhybridize, are their hybrids native or not? Um, there's, you can get a lot of opinions about that, and uh, I am not here to judge your evaluation of what is native or not. Similarly with clonal selections. Um, so if you make a clone of a plant, it's genetically identical to the plant you took it from. When we're talking about restoring native plant communities broadly, we don't use clones because we want to express the genetic diversity of that species as widely as, as, as the site will, will tolerate. Clones, though, offer some advantages, including a, a known performance and uniformity of color or habit. Um, and if you are trying to integrate a few natives into an existing non-native landscape, clones are probably quite suitable for you. We do get a little concerned, however, uh, with maintaining biodiversity. For example, um, there are several clones of red flowering current, and if you were to plant exclusively, have large-scale plantings of exclusively one clonal variant, 
there's a risk of the impact that genetics have on the rest of the native, the native population of that plant within pollination range, um, that you might be influencing the genetic uh, distribution of that species to the possible detriment of that species if we had a sudden influx of a disease or a pest that that particular clone is quite susceptible to. So again, it's not an absolutely simple answer and I'm not here to judge, but when we're talking about reforestation or reestablishment of truly native plant communities, we don't work with clones, but in the general landscaping, clonal varieties or cultivars, native varieties as they call them, um, are usually considered suitable as quote unquote native plants. But generally native plants, we like to work with seedlings to maintain the uh, genetic diversity. Source also matters. Um, some of our uh, native plants cover a wide range of ecosystems and ecotypes and plants that, where the seed is collected from one location may not cross well into plants um, from another zone. It can be merely poor adaptation, but it can also have larger scale complications. Um, Sidalsia, the, the checker mallows, for example. Um, Northern Willamette Valley and Columbia Gorge populations are significantly genetically different from uh, Eugene and points south. Um, and in terms of bloom time, that becomes relevant because Sidalsias can cross. And when you are bringing Sidalsias from one zone to another, um, the different species can hybridize and you can, you can actually be, be introducing uh, artificial uh, levels of, uh, of drift, artificial dr levels of cross, uh, cross breeding by bringing plants from a different zone that overlap their bloom with another existing species in your area. So uh, we do try to work with as local as possible. For example, we get um, our native seed uh, from Salem, um, the vast majority of our native bulbs and a lot of our native broadleafs from, uh, from a local source here in Corvallis. Um, lots of good options, but lo locality matters. Bringing in plants that are native to our area from, uh, for example, from Idaho is not really what we're trying to do when we're trying to keep a native garden. So I'm gonna talk today about native plants that are suitable for general landscaping. Now, any such attempt to put a list together is relatively arbitrary. Um, so if I didn't put your favorite plant on, um, know that I did not think about it. It's just there's a limited amount of space and I tried to select things that would be widely suitable for general purpose uh, home landscapes. So there are some considerations when we're trying to make such a selection. Um, do the plants we want to include on this list adapt to a wide variety of sites and soils? So a lot of our natives are, are very specifically adapted to, uh, to to tight environments. Um, and if you don't have that environment, they won't take at all. Um, another consideration are the plants on our list easy to plant and easy to transplant and easy to take care of. Um, this is a remarkably difficult consideration sometimes. Um, some of our favorite native plants, um, madrone is a, is a classic example. Uh, unfortunately, Madrones don't transplant very darn well. And that's one of the reasons we not on the list today and one of the reasons we don't see them a lot in the nurseries. They're extraordinarily difficult to handle. Um, when we're talking about general landscaping as opposed to uh, restoration work, it's also wise of us to, when we're putting a list together to consider that parts or all of your site you want to plant these natives in may receive summer irrigation. One of the reasons we can use natives is to reduce some of that. A lot of our natives do not tolerate that. A lot of our natives have a relatively dormant period during the dry part of the summer. They're well adapted to our climate. And while some of them don't care, some of them are very specific about not receiving extra water in the summer. They can have disease problems uh, if that's the case. And lastly, it doesn't do us a lot of good to put together a list of suitable native plants if you just can't buy them anywhere. So there's a reason some things are, are more or less available. Um, you know, commercial demand is part of it um, in, this, in the sense of some, some natives are just not as showy as some of, the art, some of the introduced plants. But there's also issues in levels of things like propagation. Um, that's the reason manzanitas uh, are, are not on the list today, and although we do handle them from time to time, they're a little hard to, to find on a reliable basis. And the reason for that is the propagation success rate is extraordinarily low, so very few growers actually bother growing manzanita. It's, it's a challenging plant 
commercially. Um, so all those considerations go into this list. And again, if I, if I left off your favorite plant, bear with me and uh, I would be happy to discuss your favorite plants uh, at, at the end if you, if you want to give me some input, input that way. So we'll go right on, on into um, looking at native plants. And we're gonna start off with trees and shrubs. And so trees and shrubs that are suitable for general landscaping. Um, vine maple is a traditional Northwest plant uh, and widely available. Uh, it's a great large shrub to small tree, quite variable in size and behavior depending on where it's planted. It's highly adaptable and we always like to caution clients that it is not a very drought tolerant tree. Yes, you do see them up on rocky slopes in the mountains, but you see them where there are where there is water sources, where there's streamlets running through. So not a super drought tolerant selection. They grow well in sun with some tendency to scorch if they're not getting an adequate amount of water. They grow well in partial shade. They'll grow fine in full shade, but one of their uh, desirable characteristics is their uh, extraordinarily good fall color. And you lose some of that when you, uh, when you grow them in a, in a shady environment. The darker they are, the less uh, fall color they're gonna typically build up. Their behavior is quite different in sun uh, versus shade too. In sun, they tend to be a really, uh, really bushy um, 10 or 12 foot uh, shrub almost. The more shade they find, the more they will try to run horizontally to find a shaft of light and then turn and go vertically. And that's thus the name vine maple. They have that, that kind of characteristic habit. Um, and so they look really different when you see them planted in a sunny landscape versus growing out in the woods under most, mostly a canopy. California lilac is a beautiful broadleafed evergreen. We don't have a lot of, of native broadleaf evergreens and it's quite a, quite a gorgeous one. It's just a tiny stretch to say native to our area. It does occur all the way up um, to just south of Eugene uh, in the wild and along the coast as well. Um, we don't typically see it in the clay soil parts of the valley because it really does like good drainage. It is extraordinarily drought tolerant and, uh, uh, and, and quick growing with two potential bloom seasons. We, we always get a bloom season uh, roughly mid spring and it's not at all uncommon for them to bloom again in the early late summer, early fall. So a fast growing shrub um, with good adaptability does require relatively dry sites um, and, uh, and a real, real fast grower, but a little bit short-lived. Um, like a lot of fast-growing first-in species on disturbed soils, it, it has a definite lifespan. We don't see them usually exceeding much over maybe 10 or 15 years in the landscape. Red twig dogwood or red osher. Um, again, very adaptable across a variety of, of lighting conditions, sun, part shade, or shade. Tends to like moist to quite wet soils will tolerate some drying out. Um, and typically, again, color is influenced by sun exposure. So to get a lot of that bright red wood, which is their, their, their characteristic ornamental habit, um, if they're really, really shady, they don't get too much of that. Uh, in addition, as they age, uh, that kind of goes away unless you are pruning them back somewhat regularly to encourage new growth. It's the, it's the newest growth, the last couple of years of growth that show that characteristic red bark in the winter. And if they're getting old and mostly gray up the, up the trunk, uh, only the very tips will show that. Ocean spray is a, is a personal favorite of mine uh, and fits some nice, uh, nice uh, environmental niches that are sometimes hard to garden in. It's a plant for part shade to shade in relatively dry locations. Um, it is a large deciduous shrub, uh, 10 or 12 feet tall, and um, bloom time we list as early summer and it will vary quite a bit depending on what elevation you actually see this plant at exactly when that bloom time is. Uh, we say early summer, but it's like late July at some of the elevations I backpack at, so um, bear, that, bear that in mind. Typically uh, late spring, early summer, June bloom. Uh, uh, Really quite, quite, a, quite a gorgeous plant in flower and with an unusual shaped leaf um, and relatively not showy except during their flowering season. They can, under good conditions, reach small tree size, 15 feet. Uh, Pacific wax myrtle. Oops, I'm sorry, I jumped a slide because my keyboard flipped there. Okay, sorry, step by step back. Oregon grape. 
the neat thing about Oregon grape is we actually have uh, three different native species. Um, the traditional Oregon grape or tall Oregon grape is a really glossy, shiny leafed plant that actually prefers a fair amount of sun. It will tolerate some shade, but it's not a deep shade plant. Another nice blooming broadleafed evergreen, uh, typically blooming in the, in the spring and having berries that are nominally edible, though they're pretty tart uh, in the summer. Um, size is quite variable, five to six feet, six to seven feet, sometimes as large as nine or 10 feet uh, under, under ideal conditions. Um, the yellow flowers are a real favorite of, of pollinators. The small berries, while you can eat them, uh, are eaten by a lot of our uh, birds and, and small mammals as well. It is a somewhat colonizing plant, but not very aggressive about spreading by root system. On the other hand, our smaller Oregon grapes, Mahonia nervosa, uh, Cascades or longleaf Mahonia, and Mahonia reptans, the, the creeping Oregon grape, um, tend to like it both dry, both on the drier side from the traditional Oregon grape and more shady. They don't really thrive in truly full sun environments. Uh, they're still evergreen and spring blooming with at least some berries, particularly on the long leaf uh, in the summer. They tend to be a bit shorter plants, um, knee high or so, and they spread a bit more rapidly, particularly in the case of the long leaf uh, Mahonia, Mahonia nervosa. Um, it can run her pretty aggressively and form fairly dense colonies of basically tall ground cover uh, if, if left to, to, to spread. Um, question in chat, when you say dry soils, do you mean year round or mainly during the summer? See, that's a really good point on our native plants. Um, generally speaking, when we're talking about dry soils, we're talking about summer growing season levels of water. It is important to note that some of our dry soil tolerant plants um, will tolerate a fair amount of moisture in the, in the uh, winter and spring and others won't. So a classic example is uh, California lilac. It never likes its, its roots to be substantially soggy. So you can plant it on a, on a berm in a, in a flat location or you can plant it on some slope and get it a little bit above the bottom of the slope and you'll usually be fine. But putting it down there where you get water, even substantial amounts of water accumulating even in the winter uh, will kill it. Um, so variable on that, we'll, we'll try, to, uh, try to clarify as we go through the, the relative tolerances. So uh, in the case of Mahonia, for example, uh, while Mahonia nervosa and Mahonia repens are drier soil plants, they, um, they will tolerate reasonable amounts of moisture as long as they're not underwater. Um, the California lilac, on the ha other hand, will not. Uh, they really don't like constantly wet soils. Pacific wax myrtle, um, uh, California and Oregon native. You see it growing extensively along the coast and sporadically inland. Uh, loves sun, loves part shade and a, a nice evergreen plant. Not much bloom show on this. It does, uh, botanically speaking, have a flower, but you'll hardly notice that they're blooming when they're in bloom. And they do set a little seed that a lot of, uh, a lot of birds enjoy. Um, used extensively as a, as a large scale screening plant uh, in a variety of locations, a very adaptable plant, one of, its, one, of its, uh, one of the pleasures about working with it. Another plant that really doesn't like waterlogged soils or super wet feet, uh, e even in the winter. Um, Indian plum or oso berry uh, is, uh, is one of my personal favorites in the, in the native plant panoply. Uh, it makes a nice big shrub out in the woodland and it typically grows, we typically find it at moderate moisture sites. Um, it was really adaptable to everything except constant bogs. It'll take some winter water pretty well. It will take summer drying out pretty well too. Again, I wouldn't put it in super, super hot dry locations. It's definitely a part shade to shade plant. Does not, does not like lots and lots of direct sun. One of the things I like about the, the Indian plum is that it blooms super early. It's one of our first bloomers out there and you'll be even driving along uh, and looking through up into those uh, bare oak woodlands that haven't even begun to leaf out yet. And you'll see all these, these clusters of white flowers popping out. Uh, and that's our, that's our native Indian plum, a gorgeous plant. It does set a small fruit. Again, the fruit is technically edible, though not particularly uh, palatable. Uh, and a lot of wildlife really appreciates it, both our early pollinators for the flowers and a number of birds and mammals for the fruit. Western mock orange, um, which I tend to think of as, as, as a relatively uh, low elevation plant, and then I get surprised. Um, so um, 
I saw them blooming in August at 8,000 feet in the Wallawas uh, in, 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 in mixed light wood. So um, typically sun, part shade, you'll see uh, quite extensive amounts of them down along the Willamette up above the flood zone. Um, wonderful fragrance. And uh, as blooming shrubs grow, one of, our, one of our later bloomers, late spring running into summer. Uh, pretty big shrub um, if you are just ultra, ultra fond of the, of the Western mock orange and you can't fit one in, there are native ours, there are clones of it that are smaller, like blizzard. Pacific nine bark uh, is another bigger shrub, uh, 10 to 12 feet, and it will adapt to sun or part shade, even fairly extensive amounts of shade in wet soils, um, meaning will tolerate floodplain and uh, will prefers to have at least some summer moisture. Um, will it tolerate drying out at least briefly during the summer? Yes, but not on the dry sites, not sites that dry out early. Um, nice late spring bloomer. It's quite a showy flower. The white flower is uh, popping out of little uh, slightly pink buds, you know, kind of a popcorn effect. It's very attractive. Uh, good pollinator plant and the dry, um, dry seed capsules behind, behind the, after, after the flowers are done are favored by a number of birds. Even aside from the food value, uh, birds like nine bark. It makes a really good habitat shrub. It's nice and dense and twiggy. For ornamental purposes, besides its flower interest, um, they call it nine bark for a reason. It has multi-layer shredded uh, shaggy bark that peels off. And so um, even when it's bare of leaf in the winter, there's something happening out there visually. It's not just bare stark stems. So red flowering currant is probably the biggest success story of our native plants, uh, achieving a large degree of commercial success. Uh, Ribe sanguinium is a spring flowering large shrub for sun to part shade. Uh, relatively drought tolerant once it's established and major, major pollinator habitat. Uh, lots of bees, lots of small insects. Um, hummingbirds, uh, in fact, are migratory hummingbirds that, that return in the spring, that go south for the winter and return in the spring. Their arrival coincides with the bloom time of red flowering current broadly um, because that's their, a key food source for them. Aside from the flowers, it does produce a berry, a current. Uh, most people find the current relatively unpalatable again, but uh, a good wildlife habitat and technically edible if you want to play with it. Nice big shrub, give it plenty of space. They're, they're, everybody likes to put a lot of them in close together and they really are better suited for a, for a wide spacing. Western spirea grows all over the, the flooded and wetland bottom of the valley here. Uh, and it's a great uh, plant in terms of a late bloomer for pollinators, uh, blooming in the summer and blooming over a fairly extensive period of the summer as well. This is a, a big shrub in that 10, 12 feet, more often six to eight, 10 to 12 under ideal conditions. And one of my, my thoughts on this one are simply that we just don't have a lot of really pretty plants that can grow with their roots actually underwater, standing water in the winter, and in sites that are also so dry that the soil cracks out in the summer. And Western Spirea will do that. It will tolerate the, that variety of, of moisture over the course of the season. So elderberries, um, and we have two here. Typically we say that the blue elderberry will tolerate more dry and the red elderberry will tolerate more wet and more shade. Both of them like moist earth soils, not super, super dry soils. Both of them are quite at home in partial shade and less so in full, full sun. Um, the flowers are showy white, um, loose umbels and uh, the berries, blue on blue elderberry and red on red elderberry, are theoretically edible. In practice, they're not bad. Uh, don't eat a lot of them raw. They have a fair amount of saponins in them. And so they can make you relatively ill if you're eating a lot of them raw. They're great cooked uh, or processed for, for, uh, for juices, wines, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, both occupy a, a, a wide variety of, of niches along the coast range and the Cascades. You don't see a lot of them down here on the valley floor. And uh, I've seen, again, elderberry at very high elevation. So very adaptable across a wide range of, of site locations. Well, when we talk about Northwest plants, people think rhododendrons because it's kind of a classic uh, Northwest thing. And, you know, it doesn't happen so much, but 25, 30 years ago when I first started doing this, it was a, 
I want to see your native plants. Where are your rhododendrons? And frankly, very few rhododendrons are native to, to Oregon, but we do have a couple. Um, the better one for landscape uses generally is our deciduous azalea, rhododendron occidentale, the western azalea. It is an extraordinarily fragrant flower uh, in the late spring, usually, usually may bloom, um, that likes um, a, a wide variety of sunlight conditions, can grow in sun, uh, partial or full shade. Um, does need pretty consistent moisture to do well. It's not a super drought tolerant plant, but a nice mid-sized deciduous flowering shrub uh, that will adapt to a variety of lighting conditions. Evergreen huckleberry is planted almost as widely as red flowering currant throughout the world. It's a widely used shrub. Um, nice little modest size broadleaf evergreen. Flowers are pretty small, but are significant pollinator habitat. Uh, berries are technically edible, but again, not, for, not anything to write home about. Um, we'll take full sun, we'll take full shade, we'll take anything in between. The more sun it's in, the more important summer irrigation will be. It likes moist to wet soils, not thriving in swamp conditions, however. Uh, you'll see this plant growing wild all over the coast, coast range, and into locations in the valley, but primarily coast and coast range here. So some perennials and bulbs. So if the, the trees and shrubs are your, um, are your skeleton, your big, your big anchoring part of your landscape, your perennials and bulbs are where your native landscape can find some color. Um, a comment in chat, um, spreading Western spirea. A friend had a terrible time with spreading Western spirea in a dry creek bed. Um, same thing with Nutka Rose. Yes, um, Western spirea is a colonizer. Uh, it's, uh, and a lot of wetland plants tend to be. It has uh, root systems that spread fairly extensively underground and then they will sprout up where, where, where they have a chance to and, and thus spread out as a, as a essentially a clonal patch, a single, uh, a single genetic patch. Um, bear that in mind when you're working with them. Um, they won't typically spread into sites that aren't fairly damp in the winter, but the situation like a dry creek bed where you have a, a natural water well, yes, they will spread profusely into that location. Nook Rose is very similar, yeah. Perennials and bulbs, uh, yarrow. So everybody looks at the picture and says, well, I can't be yarrow, it's white. Um, we're so used to seeing the, uh, the other yarrows from other parts of the world or the hybrids and clones uh, of ours that have unique colors, usually yellow, sometimes red or pink. Our native one tends to be white, but you will find scattered populations of yellow or even pink ones uh, expressed throughout the genetics of the species. So yes, they are native, uh, and, and the white one is the dominant strain for our native. Um, yarrow is a super durable plant and a super adaptable plant and provides some excellent pollinator habitat very late in the season. Uh, it's a major pollen and, and resource as well as uh, some nectary for, uh, for various types of bees. Size can be quite variable. You'll see yarrow expressed in shady locations as stretching along the ground um, or in areas that get periodically mowed or chopped as a shorter ground cover with flower spikes just popping above. Um, in a standalone location where it's not getting any real uh, competition uh, for light, nor is it getting chopped at or browsed at all the time, uh, typically a, a bit taller, usually, usually a little over knee high, 18, 24, sometimes as high as 30 inches. It's a colonizer, not so much um, a root spreader, though it does a little bit of that too, but heavily uh, from, from seed production, it reseeds itself pretty prolifically. Uh, pretty easy to control, I would say, all in all. The flowering onions, the alliums, um, we have a batch of them. And the thing about onions is we can talk about them uh, as a group and for purposes of brevity, that's what I'm gonna do today. But they are unique uh, species with unique considerations. For example, uh, Allium emplectans uh, is an upslope plant um, from sites that get some seasonal moisture but dry out substantially uh, in, in the summer. Um, others like Allium validum um, typically are literally named swamp onion. Uh, they grow in sites that are constantly wet. Uh, Allium sinuum, the picture there, the nodding onion, is somewhere in between. Most of them are adaptable across a range of light that goes from truly full sun to partial shade. None of them thrive in deep, deep shade. Um, they are bulbs, so for the most part, they are up and they flower and they die back to the ground and they have no presence in the landscape. Allium, Allium serenium, the nodding onion, uh, 
is the exception to that. Um, under irrigated conditions, it will keep its foliage most or even all of the summer. So there's actually something there in the summer besides just a brief flowering period. That's a real common characteristic of a lot of our native bulbs uh, to go dormant very immediately after flowering, as you would expect for a lot of bulbs to behave. Um, red columbine, western columbine. Uh, I like to put the two pictures in there because everybody visualizes that top inset picture there, the, the pretty kind of orangey scarlet flower with the yellow throats coming out. Um, and that is very much western columbine. However, um, that complex stand uh, of it in, in the bottom in the main picture um, is how you normally see it in the wild, how it will look in the landscape over time. The flowers are smaller than most of your commercial columbine flowers. They're born profusely on a plant that can be 24 or 30 inches tall. They're not just this little edge of the border plant. So plan accordingly when you're working with them. Um, but quite, quite an attractive uh, plant in the landscape and a good bloom season uh, going, going spring, late spring into the summer. You will see columbines occurring at a variety of, uh, of elevations. And when you play uh, on the east side much, we get up in the, in the uh, upper slope Cascades or the Wallawas, there are some uh, yellow species that are, that are Oregon natives, though not locally native as well. So milkweed is of course the, the pollinator plant of discussion now with the monarch habitat considerations. Uh, showy milkweed is our native, Asclepia speciosa. Um, and it's worth noting that while all monarchs like all milkweeds to a reasonable degree and a number of other um, butterflies use them as well, um, we have a little different population of monarchs here than they have in the Midwest. So um, our monarchs don't go as far south for the winter and they come up the coast and then in. Um, and they really prefer Asclepia speciosa over any other milkweed as a, as a larval host plant. On the other hand, the populations that go further south and then come up into the Midwest um, tend to like the Midwestern, the, 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 tr the, traditional, uh, the traditional milkweeds. Um, so milkweed can be kind of a little bit challenging to get established. Uh, there's always been recommendations to plant them from seed, but it takes forever to get a decent stand from seed. They can be planted as transplants or as bare root rhizomes, kind of like a bulb. Um, they're kind of tricky to site well. They don't want to get much summer water, but they also like to grow in locations that get seasonal water during the rainy period. So we typically find them like halfway up a ditch uh, in, in the valley. Uh, and that's a good, good idea when you're thinking about siting them, is, is down, down a slope far enough to get some reasonable moisture, but up slope high enough to dry down fairly fast. Um, they do colonize extensively to the point of being weedy, not only by their rhizomes, which can be extensive, it's not uncommon to, take a, to be planting a chunk of rhizome that's a foot or a foot and a half long, uh, but also um, they do seed off and the seed has a dandelion like consistency after the pod. It's a, it's a seed attached on the bottom of a puff and it drifts on the wind and can spread far and wide. So they do tend to kind of take over a bit once you get them established. They're somewhat challenging to establish. They're such a pretty and such a valuable resource plant. I, I kept them in anyway, despite some of the slight challenges to working with them. Okay, so I cheat to get a few more plants into my talks. Um, harvest lily, which can apply to a whole batch of different plants, typically applies to the various members of the Brodea uh, genus, which is the, uh, of the cluster of three pictures, it's your, your topmost rightmost one, uh, Brodea elegans. So Brodea elegans and Brodea coronaria uh, are the two primary Brodeas here. And they are really different in, ter in terms of um, their locations. Broadly speaking, um, Brodea coronaria will grow in like vernal pools um, in low elevations where it actually gets a lot of water in the winter. And Brodea elegans, not so much. It needs to be up uh, upslope out of the worst of the water pooling. Both of them tolerate completely dry and prefer completely dry in the summer um, in, in sunny locations. Um, so then the top left picture is Tritelia, uh, Tritelia hyacinthina. And uh, a real pretty little uh, flowering bulb. There are lots of commercial selections that have been made of it as well. Typically visually white, but if you look closer, there's usually a blue streak in the center of each, pe each uh, petal. Um, 
And the uh, bottommost picture of that grouping is uh, Diclostemma congestum. Um, and so a really pretty cluster flowered plant, very closely related to the Brodias. I learned all these as Brodia back in the day and they shuffle these in, in and out of, of different genera, figuring out exactly how they fit together. They're all very closely related. They're called harvest lilies because they, the indigenous peoples ate them. They, they intentionally dug them and, and harvested them. They're actually not too bad uh, roasted and uh, a pretty pretty widespread here in the valley. You see quite a few of them around if you're if you're looking at the right times. Of course, camas is the dominant native bulb and, and probably one of the key key species of of, of our region. Um, we actually have a couple of uh, of true camases here in the valley. Camasia lake linea is the greater camas. Camasia comash, the common camas. Honestly, in practice you have to have a pretty solid background to tell them apart in the field because they can occur in the same general zones. They can occur with approximately the same dimensions and colors. There's a distinctive difference in the keel petal between them if you ever really get excited about uh, identifying a specific specimen. Uh, in practice, uh, they're pretty widely interused. Um, camas are good wetland plants. You see them growing quite a bit in areas that are that are seasonally flooded or 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 const, even constantly moist. Um, typically, sun they will tolerate some shade. Like Linea in particular will tolerate a bit more shade than Quamash in my experience, and Quamash will tolerate a little more drying out, a little less period of, of moisture than than Lake Linea. Uh, quite great bloomers. Uh, the bulbs are again edible. Be careful to mark plants if you are if you are intentionally harvesting. Uh, we have some bulbs that the that are lookalikes. The, usually the flower is distinguishable easily, but when you're harvesting the bulbs, when the plant is dormant, the bulbs are similar enough to be mistaken and you don't wanna be eating death camas. They call it that for a reason. So uh, if that is your goal, make sure you positively identify the plants you're harvesting. Um, aside from that, major pollinator plants, good, good wildlife habitat. Western bleeding heart. Um, so European bleeding hearts are tall, relatively um, uh, clumpy perennials with a brief period of bloom in the very early spring. Our wild bleeding hearts, on the other hand, are, slow, are moderate rhizomatous spreaders, or ground cover, um, partial to full shade. And um, if they receive some irrigation or some supplemental water due to uh, being in a site where you pick up a little more rain late into the summer, they'll continue to bloom quite well into the summer. So they've got a very long blooming period to them. They will not take a lot of full, full sun unless they're well irrigated. We typically do a shade or partial shade to them. And they're short, um, typically around six inches tall and then spreading over, over a fairly large expanse of soil. Fawn lilies. Um, there's actually several erythroniums native to Oregon. Erythronium oregonum is, is our valley native, uh, just pale yellow off of white or buff colored. Uh, upside down nodding flower. We seem to have a fair number of those in our, in our, in our native perennials. Um, they like moisture in the winter and growing season, uh, but they like to summer dry out. They do not do super well in areas that are, that are irrigated. We like to use them as a spreading ground cover because they do propagate themselves pretty well and incorporate them with grasses that don't need mowing in a site you're not going to irrigate. Um, they do really well. They make a great component of, uh, of oak savanna, oak woodland type uh, plantings. So they bloom in the spring and then they have the speckly spotty leaves and then they go dormant fairly rapidly thereafter and once the leaves are down they shouldn't be irrigated. Ferns, of course we have a lot of ferns here uh, and ferns are, are mo for the most part, our ferns are shade lovers. There are a very few that really appreciate sun, particularly as some of our alpine ferns. Um, they typically are adaptable across a range of sites. Maidenhair on one end really likes it really, really wet um, and typically grows in stream banks or even boggy conditions. Um, we have some rockery ferns that like it dry except for very seasonal moisture and western sword fern is right in between. Typically moist soil is okay, will tolerate summer irrigation, um, does not require tons of moisture in a, in a well shaded environment. There's a lot more ferns out there to play with, um, but these are a couple of good starting points for some of our, our better native ferns. Another group that gets 
often overlooked when we talk about native flora are the native grasses. Um, native grasses, a lot of them are better done from seed, uh, Danthonia, for example, for, uh, for your oak woodlands. Um, some of them transplant pretty well. Some of them are fairly striking specimens integrated into a regular landscape instead of just done as restoration. Particularly, I wanted to note uh, Romer's fescue, uh, which is uh, a, a wide native, uh, widely spread native. Um, Romer's fescue is neat because it likes sun and it will tolerate both relatively wet and relatively dry soils. So it will, it will tolerate upslope conditions that don't have a long period of moisture and it will tolerate down here on the valley floor where we have quite a bit of moisture persisting uh, well into the season. It does not, however, like summer irrigation very well. Uh, so when, you've, when it's really past the, the rainy period and getting into the end of June, first part of July, really doesn't, doesn't thrive on irrigation. Uh, tufted hair grass, um, a little more shade tolerant, a little more moisture tolerant, um, and, uh, and, and quite a showy grass during its flower and seed period. So grasses are important components of, the, of our native ecosystems. Grasses are essential in many locations if you're trying to do a restoration, and some of our native grasses are quite suitable in their own right as ornamentals. Wild geranium, the only only complaint I have about wild geranium is that there are several introduced weeds that when they first come up in the spring, their leaves look a lot like wild geranium and we inevitably have period, people um, removing their wild geranium by accident when they're weeding in the early spring. So wild geranium is actually super, super adaptable, geranium oregonum, uh, sun or shade or anything in between. And generally speaking, fairly moisture tolerant as well. Um, anything but really saturated soil. So you'll find it in relatively dry locations, but you'll find it in some moist meadow type locations as well. Um, native irises, there are several. Um, the two dominant ones are Iris 10X and Iris Douglasiana. So um, uh, 10X uh, has, has, a, has a, 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 a tougher foliage um, and Douglasiana is a little more shade tolerant. Um, so adaptable across a range for both of them though. Moist to wet, none of them thrive on super, super dry soils. Um, most of them will take sun uh, and, and Douglasiana will take more shade than 10X if it comes down to it. Spring bloomers, and typically on the short side, they, they list 18 inches and really good stands I've seen that big, but I've seen a lot of native irises a lot smaller than that as well. Lupin is another plant we have a, a lot of different varieties of. Um, the, the Lupinus polyphyllus is, is, a, is a widespread one here on the valley floor because of its moisture tolerance. So lupins in garden culture uh, are typically hybrids. We have some of our native lupin parentage in a lot of the hybrids, um, but you see a wide array of colors in the, in the hybrids. In the natives, you typically see a lot of this, a lot of blues and whites and, and some light purples. Uh, that's really typical of our, of our native, uh, native lupin group. Um, they're typically summer bloomers, a little bit later than so many of our spring bulbs and, and early spring wildflowers, making them a particularly good pollinator habitat again. Uh, don't, another plant that you don't want to mistake the wild ones for the, the hybrids, because a lot of the hybrids, they've bred some really tight sizes into them, um, making them really good little bedding plants. Um, a lot of our natives, that's not the case. Uh, Polyphyllus, latifolius um, can reach for even five feet tall. They're really quite massive herbaceous plants. So they, when they do die back, they do leave a kind of chunk out of the landscape. Uh, something you want to bear in mind when you're planning. The yellow monkey flower, uh, uh, Mimulus, uh, is a great plant for a wet sunny location or a seasonally wet sunny location. Um, they will continue to bloom as long as there's some consistency of moisture. They will tolerate irrigation. Um, but typically spring into summer bloom here on the valley floor. Um, wet, to wet soil tolerant enough, we sometimes use them in ponds and waterfalls even. So quite, quite tolerant. They do colonize, they do spread uh, fairly extensively. I have to put in the common name beard tongue, but honestly, most people I hear just call them penstemons, their, 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 their botanical name anyway. We have several natives. Um, again, a lot of our natives tend towards the blue tones. Um, when you see a lot of the red and orange, those aren't our local natives. Those are California natives or natives to other regions or higher elevation dry climate natives. 
Um, typically, um, Benstemans, beard tongues like, uh, like full sun, they will tolerate some shade, they won't tolerate much shade. Um, the vast majority of them are adaptable across a range of, uh, of soil moistures. Ours tend towards the wet end, um, Benstemann Rydbergii, um, in particular going, be occurring in our, in, in our wet prairies out here. Variable in size, usually 12, 15 inches, but it's not at all uncommon to see them up around knee high. Oregon saxifrage inhabits a lot of the same habitat that Pensman Rybergii does. It's uh, wet, wet prairie. Um, sun part shade, more towards the sunny end. Um, another colonizer, primarily by seeding off. Uh, though the size listing says 12 to 18 inches, um, yeah, your flower spikes get up that high. Your little rosette of foliage is almost never that big, usually six or seven or eight inches above ground is all. Um, kind of a, an attractive plant that often gets missed because its early bloom time out in wet meadows means that people aren't out there when it's blooming, um, so sometimes overlooked. Wet tolerant enough to use in stream beds or at least edge of stream beds uh, and and ponds, uh, and other than that, pretty uh, pretty broadly adaptable again. The checker mallows, or checker blooms, they sometimes call them. Uh, several several species here. Typically, Sedalsia campestris, Sedalsia virgata, and Sedalsia cusicia are dominant ones here. Um, they're typically intermediate area plants. Um, they'll tolerate summer irrigation. They like some moisture. Um, they'll tolerate sun. They'll tolerate part shade. None of them thrive in dark, dark shade. None of them thrive in super, super, super dry locations. Um, so Sudalsia uh, vergata uh, and Sudalsia cusicii in particular are wet soil tolerant enough to use in ponds. They really do like it wet. Campestris is usually a little more upslope than that. Um, fairly big plants, um, four feet is not at all uncommon on them. They form a fairly distinctive clump uh, as an individual plant. And they bloom at the tail end of our spring blooming cycle. It's really common for me to see them blooming um, June or into or even, even early July uh, in the valley and up, uh, up in the foothills. Fall Solomon seal, uh, I've still got it under Simulasima. Um, I know they, they reoriented them to myanthemum, I think, uh, recently. Um, they do that botanically. They go through and decide that these plants are more closely related to that and they move them and then everything you learn in college you have to throw out and start all over again. But uh, nonetheless, um, whatever you call it, it it's, it's a fun little perennial to play with. It is a, it is a colonizer spreader, uh, rhizominous and seed. Um, liking moist to even wet, shady environments, often a tough site to find plants for. It's got a spring to late spring bloom and uh, red berries in the summer and despite what your mother told you about not eating red berries in the woods, they are one of the better palatable uh, berries in our, in our native plant pathway. Major pollinator plants. Um, you will see more diversity of pollinators on Solomon seals than you will on most other types of plants. Um, pollinated by flies, beetles, but you'll also get small, uh, several small bees on them as well. Because their shade environment, they are made a little more reduced in bee pollination. Okay, so here's another fun uh, quirk in, in botany, you know, I learned them as all as aster. Aster is a perfectly functional name and then they, they decided that all of our native group have to be symphiotrichin, which I can barely say, let alone spell. So uh, kind, kind of a, a, a quirk of the botanical categorization sometimes. Regardless, uh, we have a couple of natives in the group here, and uh, they're widely uh, used in, the, in landscaping, native restoration landscaping, but they do spread. Uh, they seed pretty prolifically, as you can see from the pictures, the little puffball seeds are getting ready to spread everywhere. So that's uh, subspicatum there, the typically um, bluer flowered of the two. Um, and Symphiotrachum hallii is typically a paler, almost white uh, color. They do interhybridize in the wild and in gardens when you put them close to each other and you get some crossbreeds between them. Uh, just a normal part of their thing. The fun thing about them is that we just don't have a lot of happening in our um, in our native plant groupings in the late summer. There's just not that much going on. Things are fairly dormant in August. And these are plants that are hitting their stride of bloom in August and going into September. So uh, provide a good extension to the, the seasonal interest. <laughs> 
I put trilliums in because trilliums are such a such a characteristic part of our native uh, flora. Honestly, not the easiest plants in the world to work with. It can be quite difficult to establish. Um, Trillium ovatum is probably as easy as you're going to get. Uh, Albidium is a little more challenging. There are, I forget how many species native, quite, quite a wide extent. Um, broadly speaking, they like moist soils. A few of them will tolerate truly wet locations. Um, none of them grow in substantial amounts of sun. They're all understory shade or part shade. Um, typical bulb patterns, they flower out for an, for an attractive period of a few weeks, then the foliage is present for another couple of weeks past that, and then they go dormant for the dry period and storing up their energy for the next year's growth. So there's a, a kind of a section of native plants that are generally speaking suitable for, for general purpose landscaping. Let's talk a little bit about using those in your garden. So there's some real advantages to integrating native plants into your landscape. Um, our native plants are inherently adapted to what we have to deal with, our soil types and, uh, and our local climate conditions. However, we do have a fair amount of specialization in our flora, so uh, that is obviously dependent upon planting them in sites that are suitable for them as a species and not putting them in the wrong uh, ecosystems. Our native plants provide habitat. Um, our native uh, fauna, um, insects, birds, um, pollinators of all sorts, and mammals are, they co-evolved with these plants. This is, this is what they look for to eat. This is what they're, what they're expecting to find. So they are nearly perfectly matched to our native, uh, native flora, to our native fauna. Uh, thus, generally speaking, native plants are better habitat plants than similar introduced plants. That's not to say our native uh, animals and, and critters won't adapt to, uh, to a certain amount to introduce species, but both the timing and the presentation of the food source uh, is really ideal for our native, native uh, fauna. Now, because they are inherently local, and also because typically when we're working with natives, we're working with genetically diverse groups, as I mentioned earlier, seedlings rather than, than clones or hybrids. They, it makes them generally more tolerant of disease and, in, and, and insect pressure uh, and damage. That's not to say they're immune and sometimes new diseases will come in that can be really detrimental to our native, uh, native populations. But generally speaking, because the types of diseases we have they've already been exposed to and have figured out how to work around and still be in a, a, a substantial species, they tend to have pretty good tolerance of our, of our native disease problems. But despite the advantages, there are definitely some challenges to working with natives in the landscape. Um, the biggest thing is, is the specificity of niches. Um, plants from dry rocky hillsides do not grow in wet clay. Plants from swamps don't grow on mountain peaks. Uh, we have a pretty broad array of native plants because we have a pretty broad array of ecosystems they can grow in, and it is important you match up the appropriate plant with the appropriate ecosystem. Some of our natives, as I mentioned earlier, are difficult to work with. They're either difficult to transplant or difficult to propagate um, and thus hard to acquire. Uh, madrones and manzanitas are, are two of the top that we get asked a lot about that we just can't do uh, on any kind of reliable basis. They're just not out there because they're too hard to handle. Uh, we talked a bit about summer irrigation. We'll have another slide, a couple, a couple of slides down talking about some plants that will tolerate that. Our plants evolved in a in an ecosystem where we have a substantially wet season and a substantially dry season. Our substantially dry season is during that what for most plants would be considered the active growing season, the summer. Um, and so our plants have developed various strategies to cope with the fact that there's no rainfall during that, whether that's developing storage organs uh, to, to store nutrients and come back again when the weather is better, or deep tap roots, so they reach down into the bottom aquifer layers to actually, um, actually enjoy what water is available. But that means that those plants that are super well adapted to that specific characteristic of our environment often do not tolerate um, much soil moisture during the, the, their dormant periods. They can rot or develop disease problems. 
So um, while some of our natives are perfectly happy mixed in at the edge of a lawn that's getting irrigated or mixed in with established plantings of things like rhododendrons that need some summer water to look their best, some of our natives are not. And it's definitely worth keeping that in mind when you're selecting natives to integrate into your landscape. And I don't want to get you the impression that our native plants are unattractive. We have a great array of native, native plants that are super attractive and very, uh, very useful components in the landscape. But because, again, we are working with primarily seedlings, we, are not, we, we don't have plants that there have been a lot of time spent selecting um, desirable aesthetic characteristics. They haven't been selected for large flower size, for a particular flower color, for extra long blooming periods. Um, so that sometimes does make, the, uh, make them less impactful from an aesthetic standpoint in the landscape. Um, and it's something you want to consider when you're putting them in. It, would you be better suited to maybe work with a native R uh, for your situation or a hybrid or a non-native just to have that show? Uh, or is it more suitable to, for, for what you're working with to, to use a native and to sacrifice a little bit of that consideration? So we want to work with native plants in the landscape. Um, a couple of ways we, we would typically approach that. Um, the simplest is simply to take a native plant and use it in place of a, a similar introduced plant. Um, a good example would be Instead of putting in a lilac, you put in a red flowering currant. They have similar degree of flower show. They're both very attractive showy plants. They bloom at about the same time, the red flowering currant a little ahead of the lilacs, but not by much. Um, they're similar statured plants, you know, 10 or 12 feet or so. Um, so very similar plants um, that, that could easily be just simply swapped out. An alternative approach is to dedicate a small area specifically to grouping of native plants. This has uh, been uh, promoted quite a bit as, as habitat uh, preservation in urban environments. Take a corner of your yard that's not a big deal to you to, 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 to sacrifice and dedicate it to a grouping of native plants that are suitable specifically for that location. Um, classic example of that would be like the north side of my house. Um, honestly, there's some windows out there, but we don't really look at them and it's just a little section between us and a, and a close by neighbor. Um, we don't really walk through it. It doesn't have strong street appeal viewpoints um, and filling that up with, uh, with, with native shrubs and not even worrying about their impact from an aesthetic standpoint, but just creating a habitat uh, was, was quite a reasonable use of that much space. Um, and that, that's the idea on a pocket, create a, create a small patch of, uh, of native habitat with the goal often primarily being to support flow through and biodiversity of, of, of native uh, animals. Another approach to utilizing natives in the landscape, and this is one of the things I find the most useful uh, with working with natives, is for extremely, extremely difficult sites, um, using natives to fill that environmental niche. So any given site you find here in the valley, you will find there are native plants that grow, and they may not be the plants you are particularly dramatically fond of, but we have native plants that will establish in any site you're likely to have. You've got uh, completely uh, no light under the deck in, in dry, unirrigated soil. We have plants that grow there. Um, you have a spot that is completely underwater in the winter and dries out to the cracking point in the summer. We have plants that grow there. That's, those are natural ecotypes uh, for, for plants in our area. So we can find plants specifically to that. And that's a really beneficial use of natives to, to solve some of these really tough, uh, tough locations. So we'll run through and illustrate just a couple of, uh, uh, of examples of that. So um, native plant groupings, uh, how to integrate native plants coherently as a group in a pocket uh, landscape or a broader landscape. And so one of the biggest considerations is soil moisture. And then the second consideration is usually uh, available light. So uh, for wet soil locations, and as, as was asked earlier, um, that's somewhat variable. It does not necessarily mean they have to be completely uh, completely wet year round, but typically to be uh, substantially moist, not be cracked dry or bone dry, not typical upslope rocky locations. So um, wet soil shade locations, uh, Indian plum and elderberry do quite well in that, particularly the red elder better than the blue. Maidenhair ferns, that's what they do. You find them, um, you go up the Silver Creek Falls or you go out uh, on the waterfall loop in the Columbia and in all those uh, streamlets uh, under the trees, you find, you find a maidenhair fern. 
Trillium's moist, but usually not boggy wet. And the same thing with the fawn lilies. False Solomon seal is super adaptable in anything that doesn't dry out substantially in the summer. Uh, so widely used in those locations. Nine bark um, is a typical partial understory uh, plant in along riverbanks um, and will take periodic flooding, but will not take long periods actually submerged. So that's, a, that's the consideration there. Uh, in the sunnier location, um, this is often a challenge here. This is, this is a, these are our prairie plants. Um, so western spirea, you find all over the wetlands out here as you do red twig dogwood. Um, lupins, typically in areas that get a little more seasonally dried out, and same with checker mallows, though they're pretty adaptable. Camas in true wetlands and also in um, seasonal wetlands uh, un underwater in, in, in the winter and, and really dry in the summer. Uh, some alliums, but not all alliums. Allium cernuum does good in moisture, Allium validum in, in constant wet. The harvest lilies, but only so well. Brodea carinaria will take that really well. Not all the harvest lilies take substantial amounts of, of water. Yellow monkey flower is another classic species, and we find it down here um, along the stream banks uh, in, 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 in meadows where the trees open out a bit. We find it all over the mountains uh, in, in the streams uh, where, it's, where it gets a pretty constant level of moisture. For drier locations, um, ocean spray is a nice big plant uh, for a really dry shade uh, location. Oregon grape, all forms will take that reasonably well. Uh, again, the tall Oregon grape a little more, uh, uh, more uh, dry than, than not. Sword fern, uh, one of the few ferns that tolerates substantially drying out. Uh, our irises like it, uh, bleeding hearts. Red columbine, moist to dry rather than completely dehydrated dry. And wild geranium super adaptable. Dry sun, this is your, this is your baking hot locations. Um, they're often challenging for, for natives that are used to having at least some cover. But uh, in the bigger shrub range, the California lilacs, the Pacific wax myrtles, the mock orange, and the red flowering currant will tolerate that. Um, they may need a little irrigation, particularly on the wax myrtle, the flowering currant, to get established for a year or two, uh, make sure they've got an adequate root system. But once they're established, super drought tolerant. Yarrow. Um, very adaptable in location, takes dry sun quite well. And again, some of our irises, irises are, uh, tend to like it to the drier side rather than to the super wet side. Uh, and the grasses, Romer's fescue is, our, our, is one of the better dry soil uh, grasses to play with. Um, and again, will tolerate some seasonal moisture, but drying out completely in the summer. And of course, natives that you can plant into general landscapes that will tolerate regular summer irrigation at least reasonably well. And of course, um, for shadier sites, the elders and the vine maples do that. Evergreen huckleberry is actually re reasonably tolerant of irrigation. Western bleeding heart will actually perform better with some irrigation as well. Wild geranium will get longer, more persistent bloom. Um, Solomon seal. Um, the nine bark, as we mentioned earlier, is a, is is a quite cons consistently moist soil plant. Doesn't really do well in sites that dry out. And does thrive under uh, moderate irrigation, and most ferns likes like irrigation just fine. Uh, for sunnier locations, um, everything that was on the, the wetland list usually qualifies. Um, worth also mentioning, western azalea um, does not really like drying out, loves an irrigated sun location. You often think of them as a, as a shadier plant, but they, they actually thrive on a, on a sunny but irrigated location, as do the various penstemons. Yeah. So, leave you with a parting thought and then I'll open up and take any, any verbal questions or any additional chat questions you might have for me. Um, it says, you know, native plants aren't just uh, the, 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 the purview of, of geeks and plant nerds and, and wildlife ecologists. Um, we have a great wealth of native aesthetic beauty, um, native habitat plants, um, and it really is a good idea to incorporate them, whether you're doing actual native landscapes or just incorporating a few natives into your general landscape, uh, to take advantage of the, the habitat and the, the beauty that our natives provide. At that point, I would Welcome any questions and again you can uh, you can open mic and ask or you can uh, or you can uh, type in chat.
Western azalea and powdery mildew. Okay, so almost all deciduous azaleas get powdery mildew. Um, to one extent or another. It's real common here as they go dormant late in the summer in particular. Western azalea is particularly prone to mildew issues. There is no absolute avoidance, but watering the roots rather than the, than the foliage helps some. Um, planting them in more sun. People actually plant their, their western azaleas too shady uh, in, in many regards. Uh, they would actually like a little more sun. Uh, other than that, no, that is something you'll have to deal with. Um, in my experience, powdery mildew is, uh, on, on deciduous azaleas in general, western azalea in particular, is um, aesthetically unpleasing and can impact the, the development of the plant, but is seldom a fatal or eliminating concern. Question uh, also, are all natives deer resistant? No. Um, in fact, a great number of natives are specifically browse species. So uh, in terms of deer resistance, um, plants that are relatively fibrous, tough, prickly, um, tend to, to avoid uh, deer pressure, as do plants that have extraordinarily severe uh, bitter flavors um, or strong, strong scents. So as you go through uh, and, and kind of play with the list there, I mean, I mean, Oregon grape is super high on the deer resistant list. It's in the barberry family. It's got it's extraordinarily astringent flavors, um, thick and somewhat spiny leaves, um, generally not typically palatable. Um, grasses, ornamental grasses and ferns are typically deer resistant. It's not the types of things they eat. They're really not built for grazing. They're browsers. Uh, but past that, you're going to have to play a little bit uh, within your zone. For example, red flowering currant does get browsed when, when deer pressure is high, but does tend to get leave, left alone when there are other things to eat. Um, question is, can Ceanothus be grown Florida zone 9b? Yes. Um, California lilac, Ceanothus can be grown in Florida zone 9b, provided that you have quite reasonable drainage. So. Ceanothus make it up into our range here in a zone, maybe we're a, we're a warm seven or a cool eight, depending on, on how you slice us. Um, but the vast majority of them are actually native all the way down through California. Um, so they're used to warmer climates actually than we are. We are the very northern limit of the potential growing range for Ceanothus. Uh, you might not want to use our native Thersiflorus. Uh, you might prefer to use some of the some of the hybrids or some of the California natives like Ceanobus impressus that are maybe a little better adapted for your for your extreme heat. Uh, but other than that, yes, that is an option. Lists of plants for oak restoration. Well, um, honestly, I think you're 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 ahead to go online because there are extensive. Um, multiple double digit page references available free online specifically on oak savanna restoration. Uh, if that's too much of a, of a delve for you, um, you can email me, Darren at Chenards.com. I, I can refer you to more specific references or you can contact uh, Heritage Seedlings in Salem. They do a lot of work on oak restoration from seed primarily rather than from transplants and are extensive. But there's both um, in the Portland area and in the Corvallis area, there are, there are nonprofit organizations heavily focused on specific oak savanna restoration. And I would defer to their references as better than anything I could put together. All right, well, I want to thank you all for attending. I'm uh, glad we had a chance to do this and uh, I will be here for the next Zoom class and beekeeping I think is next up and uh, I will look forward to seeing any of you then. Uh, follow up question on um, Romer's fescue in Upland Prairie, which is excellent use. Prairie June grass is the second grass. So prairie, prairie June grass, um, is not one I actually have a lot of, of experience with, uh, just, just peripheral. Um, it should be very well adapted though to, to what you're doing in an upland prairie, uh, a very typical species for that type of habitat. Um, I think that would be quite, quite suitable, absolutely. All right. Thank you all and uh, have a good day.